A few isolated groups in the backwater of American life still hold perverted notions of what America is all about. Recently, in some places in the nation, there's been a disturbing reoccurrence of bigotry and violence. To those individuals who persist in such hateful behavior, you are the ones who are out of step with our society. You are the ones who willfully violate the meaning of the dream that is America. And this country, because of what it stands for, will not stand for your conduct. If there's anyone who has mistakenly attached himself to our party in the belief that we are not open to citizens of every race and religion, then let me remind you, tonight this hall belongs to the party of Lincoln, and the exits which are clearly marked are for you to walk out of as I stand this ground without compromise. And our country must abandon all the habits of racism because we cannot carry the message of freedom and the baggage of bigotry at the same time. Welcome back to Morning Joe. Donnie Deutsch, Rick Tyler, Nick Confessori still with us, along with The Atlantic's Julia Yaffe. And joining our conversation, the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton, Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today, Susan Page, and former Republican counsel to the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee, Sophia Nelson. Sophia is a contributor to NBC.com and NBC Black and author of the book E Pluribus One, Reclaiming Our Founder's Vision for a United America. Welcome, everybody. Um, Rev, let me go to you first. We just saw a rundown of Republican presidents or Republican presidential candidates, beginning with Ronald Reagan early in his first term, going to Bob Dole at his nominating convention in 1996, and George W. Bush at his second inaugural address, condemning racism, condemning white nationalism, condemning the very things that we have now seen bubble up in a very public way, again, in American life under President Donald Trump. You've known Donald Trump for many, many, many years. Do you believe he has it in him to condemn what we saw in Charlottesville? And if so, why didn't he do it? I think that Donald Trump has demonstrated down through the years that he is not above whistle uh, blowing to uh, those that have had feelings and, and, and real beliefs in bigotry. I mean, let's not forget the first time we heard from him in a social political context in New York, he was buying ads calling for the death penalty of five young black and Latino boys accused of a, 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 of a despicable act of rape in Central Park, who DNA later cleared, and he still said he felt the city shouldn't the settle. The death penalty. Them. This yeah. is the death penalty. Yeah. We're not talking about bring them to trial. Right. We're talking about he called for the death penalty. So all the way to the Bertha uh, uh, issue that he became one of the faces of, he has played on divisiveness. He's played on the part of New York City racial politics that defeated Dave Dinkins. He's nationalized that. But to come as president, we have the right to expect our president to operate differently than the, those of us that have normalized that's Donald Trump. Reverend, He's but, the president Reverend, now. But you're even dancing around it. We've done this for years where he plays to it versus saying he is. Don't you need to now come out? Enough is I'm not just he plays to it. Well, not only he's, he's a racist. Can you say no, he's a I'm racist? No, not, not I, I, Can you say he's a racist? I, the reason why I think I think you trivialize it when no, you make I'm not, it personal. Wait a minute, Danny. I've been fighting this all Donnie, my life. No, you know me tell. a long time. Don't get like Trump with the show, okay? Right. I've been fighting this a long time. They want us to make it just. <laughs> Then we're going to debate on Donald Trump, is he a racist? He is a proponent of racism. He has been one to sell that. I'm not trying to be his psychiatrist. What's the difference? The, the difference is I don't want to put him on a couch and deal with his psychological personal problem. I'm dealing with his public policies. I'm dealing with the fact that he is a man that will sit up and not call a domestic terrorist attack that has killed a young woman and he is the head of state. I'm dealing with the fact that he is a man that has not taken a position on people that are going to rallies, that are white supremacist rallies, with his name on their hats and with his slogan on their hats. To deal with it just as Donald Trump as an individual. He's a president. 
That's what you must deal with, his presidency. And I think and that you can't say he the president wants is it racist. to be... You can't say I that. I think that you minimize... I you think you maximize. I, I, I think that you are trivializing it because you make it Donnie or Al against Donald. We're talking about the president and his policies. Exactly. Sophia, what did you see yesterday or over the weekend as you looked at Charlottesville? What were we watching there? This is obviously white nationalism has always been there. It was out in the open for many, 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 many years in this country and then went a little subterranean for a while. But there's something that's happened in this country recently where these people feel like they've been given some kind of cover to come out in the open. Well, uh, you know, I wrote a piece on NBC uh, Black and NBC.com titled This Is Us. And uh, the fact of the matter is, Willie, this is us, our history, the founding of this country. We don't like to talk about the fact that this country was founded half slave and half free and that racism was at the very core uh, slavery through segregation. This country is founded on notions of racial bigotry. And for us to deny that and to keep denying that is part of the problem. Part two, what I saw in Charlottesville, and I live in Leesburg, Virginia, so I'm about 40 miles away from Charlottesville, was beyond disturbing because I want to know what makes young white men of 20 years of age want to follow Nazis. I want to know why Dylan Roof goes into a church and kills nine African Americans in Charleston and, and feels like this is something that they need to do. And I think that we're not having the real discussion about what the underbelly of the beast here is apps absolutely positively there has been code talk since the election there's been a resurgence of racism and bigotry and I think the president missed a huge opportunity on Saturday to call it what it is Susan Page you're writing in the USA Today about trouble in Trump land discussing uh, the way some of his supporters have been feeling recently about Donald Trump there is a core that will go with him and I've heard even over the weekend some people say of course I don't love and I have no respect for and I have completely complete contempt and disdain for the KKK and neo-Nazis and everybody else who was marching through the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia. But I still like that he's standing up for who we are and helping us take peace of our America back. Do you think that group of people, whatever that number is, 30 percent, 35 percent, will ever leave his side? You know, we found something interesting. We've gone back to a voter panel we set up of Trump supporters. We've gone to talk to them four times this year, first in the heady days of the inauguration in January, and just recently in the past 10 days or so. And we heard something different this fourth time around. For the first time, we heard these Trump supporters couching their support with some caveats. Yes, I still support him, but I wish he could get something done through Congress. Yes, I support him, but I'm worried by all this turmoil in the White House staff. Several people volunteered that they did not like how Attorney General Sessions had been treated by the president. They didn't understand why the president did that. So we're not seeing them say, oh, I regret my vote. I wish I had voted for Hillary Clinton. But we are seeing qualms emerging that we haven't seen before. These are issues that the president's going to have to address to hold these supporters. And I think that's one reason we're seeing things like this remarkable re-election campaign ad that started airing on TV this weekend. Uh, Julia, a question for you. So that montage we showed at the beginning of the segment of Republican presidents and candidates talking over the years, obviously that's the story that conservatives tell themselves about the movement and what they believe in. It's the high church of Republican politics. Uh, Trump obviously found that there was a strain uh, and an audience for what he does on race and immigration. Did he find something new? Was it always there? Did he activate it? What is really going on with that movement and the people who are entranced and gladdened to see him and, and, and see his politics as linked to that kind of politics. Well, you've seen a lot of this kind of discussion on the right that actually the slaveholders and the Confederates were Democrats and that they're the party of, Link of Lincoln, completely ignoring Nixon's Southern strategy and the flip between Democrats and Republicans. And so now they're hiding behind that 19th century Republican legacy and mistaking the 20th century Republican legacy. Um, I think that this is this is a key part of his campaign. This is and his campaign and his presidency. It's a it's a backlash to what they uh, deride as identity politics and a backlash to frankly to the first African American president. Rev, does anything change out of this out of this conversation we've been having now for 48 hours 
Does it change the dynamic in Washington? Does it change the dynamic in the country? I think it can. I think that when you see something as blatant as this, it can lead to change. Uh, uh, we're having a thousand ministers march on the anniversary of Dr. King's speech two weeks from today. I've had more white moderate ministers call me now saying I'm marching with you, which is why I don't want to get into name calling and give them a way out. Oh, Donald Trump would love to say, oh, Al Sharpton just called me a racist. I don't have to do anything. I'm not excusing you. I'm saying your policies are racist. Defend your policies because people are hurting. People are unevenly and unequally employed getting health care, getting education. That's what you want to debate about in this country, not about people's personal name calling. And I think that a lot of people are shifting now saying, wait a minute, if you can't denounce something as raw as this, let me look at your policies. I'm not going to get in the way with that, of that by how we display ourselves. So we're putting the moral leaders, a thousand ministers, to march from Martin Luther King's monument. They stood at Rodney Lee's monument. We're going to Martin Luther King's monument and show the America of today, not the American of the Confederacy. Let Mr. Trump then for defend that his policies don't represent that. We can always get in a private room and argue about how the bigot that I think he may be or that uh, Danny may think he may be. But let us, I'm going to keep calling you Danny. <laughs> uh, but, but let us not let him have an escape route because what he wants is us to act like him and we are not going to bring ourselves to Reverend, that. Reverend right. Arnold, let's agree to disagree. I like the, okay, pa the right. passive-aggressive <laughs> Danny. I like it. <laughs> Sophia, before I let you go quickly, what's the best case scenario that comes out of this Charlottesville? that we begin to actually talk to each other and hear each other. I think that Charlottesville was a wake-up call. And as I said, until we start telling the truth to one another and being honest about, as Reverend Al rightly said, there's economic despair, there's poverty, there's joblessness, and white working-class America is feeling the pinch, but so is black and brown America. And I want my white brothers and sisters to know we hear you, we see you, we understand, but we're feeling the same thing. So we're not enemies of each other, and we've got to stop fighting each other and start talking to each other and finding a way forward, as Reverend Al said, and talking about the issues that we need to focus on as a nation. That's the best outcome. Well said. Sophia Nelson, thank you. Sophia's piece is on NBCNews.com. It's now time for Business Before the Bell.